I'm Barry Kibrick, and I want to thank all of you who have been tuning into our show via YouTube. As a staple on PBS, I'm so grateful that you can now see our full episodes online. I hope you're enjoying them, and please subscribe to our channel so I can continue to make them available to all. Thank you. What if conventional medical wisdom made a paradigm shift and began looking deeper into us as people, not just patients? I'm Barry Kibrick, and my guest, Dr. Judith Orloff, is on a mission to do just that. With her book, The Empath Survival Guide, she leads the charge for the medical community to embrace the most sensitive and compassionate amongst us and to deal with us all in a more holistic manner. Judith, it, it's been a while since you've been on the show, but it is such a pleasure to have you back. And, and this book in particular, I think, is going to really reflect with a lot of our viewers. I'm so happy to be back, Barry. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I, I want to start with this because you're a regular MD. You're a regular doctor. But yet you, because you're, as you say at the title of the book, you're, you're such an empath yourself you really understand the issues facing so many people that are very empathetic and very sensitive to the world around them, to the people around them, to, to life. Right. Yes, empaths are emotional sponges. And they not only feel things, they actually take energy and emotions and even physical symptoms into their own bodies. And an empath can have a big heart and is so open and loving and deep and passionate, but empaths need to learn skills not to take on the angst of the world into their own bodies because then they suffer. Then they get anxious and tired and depressed and some become agoraphobic because the world is just too much to deal with. Well, and, and that's why you make it clear that there's a spectrum. Right. We hope, in fact, that all of us, and virtually every sane person has a little <laughs> empathy. Am I correct? We, we want that. What you're dealing with, though, is those that are, as you said, the sponges, the, the people who sense the other's energies, their physical attributes, right. also could lead to very positive feelings because when things are going well, it happens, but you're more concerned with when it leads to their own embodiment of this stress. Right, as an empath, it's fantastic to absorb your joy or your compassion into my own body, and that's really positive for empaths, but what they don't wanna do is take on everyone else's pain. Empaths are giving people, they tend to be caregivers, and they tend to wanna to fix other people. So these are all issues that need to be addressed with my empath patients, because that's not a healthy way to live. You wanna be empathic, but you don't wanna absorb like a sponge. And let's also clarify for the viewers, there's a difference between empathy and sympathy. Right. Sympathy, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think sympathy is the feeling that, oh, I can relate to what you're going through, but I'm not experiencing it myself. Exactly. Your heart goes out to somebody, but you're not feeling so much with them that you're taking on their pain. When they break up with the relationship, you're not feeling that pain of the breakup in your body. And that's where the empath needs to draw the line. And that's why the skills in the book are so important for empaths. Because as an empath, I couldn't really survive without these skills. I would be taking on energy and emotions everywhere I go. And certainly as a psychiatrist and a speaker, I can't really afford that. So what I've learned to do as an empath is to be with people in a very centered place, heart-centered place, but not take on their suffering into my own body. And that's been my savior. Well, in fact, I, I can't, you couldn't possibly treat empathetic people <laughs> if you weren't able to do that. Am I correct? It's true, but you'd be surprised how many healthcare professionals are burnt out. They're empathic therapists, empathic healers, and they take it on, and so they have to stop practicing. But at the same time, you want, I don't want to, you sort of want to lay, lay down the gauntlet to the medical profession because they're not always, and in fact, I would have to say mostly, not all, by the way, I have met doctors that are just phenomenal, but yeah. not all of them in particular 
are really dealing with the human being on their holistic level. So especially important is when you're an empath and you're feeling things and your body is running on such a high-tuned frequency right. like that, most doctors could either A, misdiagnose, or in the worst case, even more than a misdiagnose, is a diagnose that, a, a sort of, not even a diag, uh, not even a, uh, diagnosing the problem, but in a weird way, they can make it worse. Oh, it's so true. Um, the problem is empaths go to traditional medical doctors and they get misdiagnosed. And then they're given medications, which isn't the primary treatment for empaths. And then these poor empaths come to me on these larger doses of medication, which they can't tolerate because they require lower doses of medication if they need it at all. And they just need a whole fresh view. And so what I'm suggesting in the book, if you think you're an empath or you wonder if you're an empath, take the are you an empath quiz. And there's certain statements that are just giveaways. For instance, empaths replenish with a lot of alone time. They don't replenish with other people. So that's very different. And empaths don't have the same filters that other people have between themselves, their own bodies, and the environment. And so everything affects them. And what that means is that they're very sensitive in crowds. They don't usually like crowds because they absorb the energy that's there of all the people who are together. Because when I was little, I couldn't go into shopping malls or crowded places because I'd walk in fine and walk out exhausted or with some ache or pain I didn't have before, or depressed or anxious, and I had no idea that I was an empath. And my mother, who was a doctor, said, dear, you need to just get a thicker skin, which oh. is the worst possible thing to say to an empathic child. Well, you know, and, and you, you bring that up just because empathic child happens to be a boy. Oh, now yeah. you've got some way more serious issues. Not that that boy is not going to be a great man or a great kid even, but if they're extremely sensitive in a world where men are supposed to not have that many feelings on that level, that's a whole different story. Little boys who are growing up in a society that disdains empathy and sensitivity grow up believing they're sissies or weak, which is so far from the truth. And I feel like it's my role as a psychotherapist to help parents and their children to not let that happen, to really encourage sensitive, empathic children to develop their gifts and grow with them and flourish as well as set up mechanisms not to absorb. I always believed that it is much easier to take an empathetic young boy and turn him into a tough man than to take a tough boy and make him empathetic. Yeah. Absolutely, but our society does a lot of damage to the masculine energy in young boys who are empaths. And so that really needs to change because I am the biggest fan of vulnerable, sensitive men who are grounded in the masculine. They're not over-feminized. I think that's what people are afraid of when you say develop your sensitivities. It's about being vulnerable and strong and there's nothing more sexy than that. You know, you say there's, uh, I, I wanted to emphasize, there are a lot of exercises in this book. We're not yes. going to be able to get into them, but I, I just wanted to emphasize that because when they take this home, they'll be able to work through these things we're talking about. But there's, and this is kind of an interesting line you use because it, it, I'm, I'm f kind of going off of that male image there. To protect sensitivities while maximizing benefits. Yeah. That's, if there's, a key goal to this, what you've written here, it's to do that. It's to be able to protect the sensitive person and let them realize the maximum benefits that that sensitivity really gives them. Absolutely, but that means that the sensitive person needs to express their needs authentically with their friends, their partners, so that their needs are met. Because empaths who are not expressing their needs and trying to fit in some paradigm of, for instance, too much togetherness in a relationship, when they need to have a little bit more alone time than what is typical, then they suffer. Now you said yourself though, and I think this is again, an important key to just the viewer, no matter what. To become whole, these are your words, I had to embrace my sensitivities, not 
run from them and i think that's probably the the it's what uh fight or flight right that's one of our first things is to run away from something we are not comfortable with absolutely well i write about how as a teenager I ran from my sensitivities by getting involved with drugs and trying to squash them, now, which is not a healthy way to deal with sensitivities, but I'm saying it's very common. As I work with a lot of people in 12-step programs who are in recovery who said they go into alcohol abuse, substance abuse, and all the addictive behaviors to squash their sensitivities and all the tremendous feelings that they're having. And then they go into recovery and are able to deal with it in a clean and sober way. But addiction and being an empath are often hand in hand. Well, there's one skill that, that you say must be learned, and that is to deal with the sensory overload yeah. when too much is coming at you too quickly. Yes. Because that's when you can get into all sorts of things from panic attacks to everything. And, and I've seen it. A panic attack is really your belief that you're dying yeah. at that moment in time. That's what it feels like. Yeah, it, it can feel that way. One thing I, I teach everyone in the book and all my empath patients is when they start to feel anxiety coming on, let's say they're at a gathering and they're talking to someone and suddenly they start to feel anxious because they're picking up the other person's anxiety and bringing it into their own bodies. For them to honor that and excuse themselves, go in the bathroom, take a few deep breaths, do a three minute meditation that I suggest in the book to put your hand on your heart and focus on something you really love. Well, I, I think that's also the key to what you're teaching here is that we're never gonna get rid of this. So what we have to do is learn to take charge of it rather than become victimized by it. And to be very compassionate with yourself and to become an empowered empath. That's why I wrote this book is to empower empath. But compassion is key. When you're feeling tired, you have permission at that time to say, no, I don't feel like going out tonight. I need to stay home and meditate. I need to go in my bath and light all my candles around my bath. I need to be with my animals. And to be able to say, no, I'm so sorry I'm disappointing you, but no. But Doc, I, as a psychiatrist, you know this better than anyone. When we get in those low thinking moods, there's a tendency to blame ourselves. Yes, that's, yes. that's the problem, is that it's so hard to break that cycle. Yes, but one must train themselves, and it's something that you can reprogram yourself. When you start to feel anxious because you're on sensory overload as an empath, at that point you want to talk to your inner child and say, sweetheart, it's fine. You're feeling overwhelmed now. You need to take yourself out of this situation and go to your safe place and calm down. And that's fine to leave. It's okay. And so you have to have that inner positive self-talk as the feelings of sensory overload are coming over you. And that decreases the sensory overload, actually. You're the first line of defense with that sensory overload. You know, it's like that uh, when, they, when they tell you in the plane, put the oxygen mask on yourself first, <laughs> then you can give it to your child. If you don't take care of yourself first, as empathetic and as, as much you want to help the other, you can't. Right. I mean, I've become fierce about my energy needs. If I don't protect my energy needs, and especially when I'm on this book tour now, and I'm around hundreds and hundreds of people, I need to set time limits to meditate in the hotel room. I need to be quiet. I need to not talk. I need to not have that sensory stimulation before I go out in a crowd. And I am fierce about setting those limits and boundaries because I know how to take care of myself. And that's what empaths need to do. Learn what your needs are and not be afraid to speak up about them. Well, is that, is one of those things what you call the difference between connection and attachment? Is, is that one way of dis separating the two things? Is that, because those words, when I saw that, I said, that's, that's an interesting combination, the difference between connection and attachment. That's an interesting application of that principle. Yes, it can be. 
um, where you're connected to your own feelings, including your anxiety, but you're not attached to it. You're not panicked by it. And the same is true with other people, where you could become connected to other people, but not so attached to them, you become obsessed with the person. So there's a difference in energy in terms of the level of connection that you have. Connection is healthy, attachment is draining. In today's society, empaths are the pathfinders. They're the forgers. They're the ones that really, in sort of the insensitive hurry up world, may be the saving grace to bring us back into balance. Well, I believe that empaths will save the world and that em empathy is the medicine the world needs right now because empathy allows you to understand where another person is coming from, whether you agree with them or not. And unless you can get to that place, there is no hope of bridging those gaps between people. And empathy doesn't guarantee you're going to get through to everyone, but I believe it's our only hope. And that's why I feel so passionate in supporting all of you empaths out there in embracing your gifts and being comfortable with them. Well, the other bridge you talk about is vulnerability and strength because those yeah. two things are also attached yeah. with a bridge. I mean, you need, mm -hmm. but they're not separate. If You can be very vulnerable and very strong. Absolutely, and that's so attractive, and that's what true power is, to be vulnerable and strong. It's not just to be a disembodied head talking from your mind all the time. It's about being in your heart, feeling empathic, and also having your reason and your rational thought, you know, just on, you know, a very active, but blending everything. It's not either or. We're mind, body, and spirit. We're blending our empathy with our mind and our thoughts and our being and our souls, being one whole. You know, you, you just mentioned the word soul. You, you go so far as to say it's an empath's sacred responsibility. It is to not just go into hiding because you're so overwhelmed. We need all you empaths out there. Everyone who is relating even a little bit, if everyone has a little bit of empath in them. And those of you who are caring and loving and getting burnt out by this world because of all the stress and the turmoil, this is time to take care of yourselves. This is time to nurture your loving heart and make it stronger than ever but also be fierce about your own needs and taking care of yourself so you have the power to be empathic in the midst of adversity. Your words, and I think these, in my, I, I triple started, so at least for today, these are my most important ones. No matter what's happening in life, you always have control of your attitude. Yeah. That is my gosh, when you could really make that realization, and I know for a fact it is so easy to say and so hard to do, but that is the ultimate, is you can't necessarily control that situation, but you can control that attitude. Again, I restate it, easy for me to say, simple to say, but very difficult to actually achieve. It is, but it's a goal to aspire towards every day, every moment. And if you fall short, that's fine too. But you have control of your attitude. And even if you dislike somebody, the goal is to come from your higher self, not your smaller self. And the higher self is the place of the heart. And if you can say, I'm going to come from my heart. I don't like this person at all, but I'm going to come from my heart. And I'm going to use my empathy to try and understand this person. And I can only tell you that magic happens so many times when you do that, when you could reach beyond the us versus them and empathically feel into somebody and connect to them. It is so exciting. I mean, I think it's a secret to so many things going on in the world. But yet, you give us a little warning energy vampires. Yes. Now, let's face it, as you say, empaths are almost attracted to energy vampires sometimes because that's where they're most needed. But that's, you, you really can't have them in your life, people that zap your energy. Yeah, there's a chapter in the book on the attraction between empaths and narcissists who are the most dangerous of energy vampires. Energy vampires suck your energy, anybody's energy. But the empath is particularly susceptible to them because they don't have the filters. 
if they're around an energy vampire who is sucking at you or draining you with chronic talking or being a tra drama queen or being a victim or being negative or worst of all being a narcissist the empath just goes down and, and her his or her energy is deflated with that and so all the more reason to learn how to deal with each type of energy vampire have a strategy and then also eliminate the ones you don't need and never never get involved with a narcissist and if you can help it and one of the ways of avoiding that you say is to know the difference between venting and dumping yes and I, I go go into because <laughs> I, I I've seen both and I know both but but that's an important distinction because venting a, an empath probably is very good with, I'm guessing, and dumping, though, is the vampire, basically, who's doing the dumping. Yes, and for instance, with anger, empaths have a really hard time with yelling and anger and dumping because it feels like it's toxic energy coming right at you. And so I have a no yelling rule around me simply because it's too hard for me to take. It's way too hard for me to take, but if you vent, venting is putting in a request saying, I have something to express now, is, it a, is now a good time to do it? So you get the person's permission first, and then if they, they say no, maybe later, then pick a time and say, all right, my feeling is this. You never blame the other person. You say, I feel hurt when you're criticizing me, whatever your issue is. Whereas dumping is not asking for a request and saying, you make me feel this, you're the cause of this, and starting to yell and blame and be hurtful. And dumping is not acceptable for an empath. It will demolish an empath. Now you said blame, and you mentioned this before, but I think it deserves repeating maybe even twice, and one more time after this possibly. Remember, and this is what you said earlier, to be compassionate with yourself. And you said these words, no shame and no blame. Now, as I said, I do believe that's the hardest thing. And I think if you're an empath, I think it makes it twice as hard. It's because true. you're so sensitive to the other person. Not that you're not sense. I want to be careful to say that just because you're sensitive to other people, and that's what makes you empath empathetic, doesn't mean that you're not extremely sensitive to your own needs. But oftentimes, that feeling of sensitivity, you're almost ashamed of. Yes. And that's yes, what you need yeah. to break. Yes, and empaths take all that blaming and shaming in. And they often feel that they're responsible for everything that happens in the world. So part of the recovery from the negatives of being an empath is realizing that's not true. And really getting your ego out of the way because, you know, it's really none of your business to take on other people's stuff. And if you feel shame and blame, if I'm working with somebody who feels very ashamed of themselves, that's their healing work to do. And so I help the empath get in touch with where does that come from? Your narcissistic father who said you were never enough. Now where is the core of that shaming? And begin to heal that so that you don't communicate that way. It's not acceptable communication for empaths or anyone else. You always have to communicate with compassion and empathy, and if you're not in that place, to put off the communication. But Doc, isn't it also true oftentimes that any patient of yours, let's not just even say they're empathetic, but any that ha is dealing with uh, empathy as a, uh, an issue, because we know it's not, it, but isn't it sometimes even harder when you can't trace it back to your parents and things like that? I know that when you have sometimes a very good background, you still can have internal issues you deal with. And when it sometimes is easier to say, oh, it was my narcissistic father or my abusive mother or my drunkard uncle, it's oftentimes harder when you look back at your life and say, I don't even know why I'm this way because I had such a loving environment. That seems to be the hardest thing for a doctor to penetrate to a patient. Yes, well, let's say that's so. Let's say you can't find a trigger. Then the work is to be compassionate with yourself in that mystery. You know, to really say, honey, I don't know where that's coming from, but I'm going to love you through this, and I'm not going to oh. let that take you over. Oh, say that. I could see that I, 
I've never heard it put that way, but I've always found that to be the biggest, even I had a year of therapy and that was one of my <laughs> biggest problems. And say that again, so you, you, you can't find the trigger, say it again. If you can't find the trigger, you say, honey, that's okay. It's all right if you don't know where it came from, you're feeling it and I'm gonna love you through this and I'm not gonna let you get stuck in that. I'm going to love you through this, Judith, because that is the way I'm going <laughs> to end it. I'm going to end with your words, though. The empath's journey is the adventure of a lifetime. Sensitive people have so much to be grateful for. I am so grateful you graced our set today, Judith. Thank you so much. You're so welcome, Barry. Oh, it is my pleasure, and thank you all for joining us. Now, before Judith leaves, I'd like to leave you with these few more words from the Empath's Survival Guide. We are all part of the empath family, connected by our sensitivities and heart. Let's feel comfort in the simple knowing that we each exist and that in our hearts, we support one another from near and from far. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between our sensitivities and our heart, you will see the connection and realize we are all part of this human. To connect with Barry, like him on Facebook and follow him on Twitter at Barry Kibrick. And to contact Barry directly, view past episodes of Between the Lines, and read his weekly blog, visit us at barrykibrick.com. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Sam Ash Music, a proud sponsor of Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick. Sam Ash has been serving musicians since 1924. To unlock your inner musician, information is available at samash.com. <laughs>